Welcome to the Radical Lifestyle Podcast, brought to you by Generation to Generation, where you will be inspired by the past, equipped for the present, and prepared for the future, as we engage in conversations with people from around the world. Hello everyone, this is Andrew and Daphne from Generation to Generation, and our guest today is Mark Goodwin Hudson. Mark, for people that don't know who you are, can you just say a bit about where you're from and what you do? Andrew, Daphne, thank you very much. Um, Thank you for including me on this podcast. Uh, I live in England. I live in Somerset. Um, I was in the army, uh, British army, up until about two years ago. I did 27 years in the British army. Uh, And since then, I've been working for a series of non-government organizations focused on protecting civilians in conflict. Uh, And at the moment, uh, I'm working... Uh, in support of uh, civilians in Syria, but not in Syria, working from home in Somerset. Um, Now, uh, we won't go too much into detail on this, but uh, I've known Mark uh, for what feels like a number of years now, but in reality, I don't even know if it's been two weeks. Uh, We met uh, through a mutual friend uh, and were both thrown together to... (laughs) try and help rescue people in Afghanistan. Um, But before we, maybe we can touch on some of that later, can we just dive back into your history? Um, You say you served in the military, in the army for 27 years. Yes. Um, How did you get into the military? Is that something you just always wanted to do as you were growing up? How how did that happen? So um, everybody in my family, sort of for generations, is either in the army, the navy, or the church, or in some cases, a doctor. And um, I didn't want to go into the church. And um, my desire was to to, to be a soldier. And when I used to hear about all the things that some of my ancestors had done, I felt cheated that I wasn't around during the time of the Second World War. Uh, And it's probably a slightly warped Feeling. But I think that um, if you are called to be a soldier or to whatever it is you're called to, then you will have a deep yearning inside you and a deep desire inside you to do that. Whether it's a soldier, you know, a, a, a boat maker or a, a, a candlestick maker, whatever it is that God has called you and made you to, to do. Um, the good works before the beginning of time that he has uh, equipped you to do, um, that it will be inside you, deep inside you. So um, I joined the army in uh, 1992, having been to university, and uh, I served in Bosnia, I served in Kosovo for the invasion of Kosovo. I then worked in Whitehall on the Iraq desk in the run up in the aftermath of the Iraq war in 2003 and then I was in Iraq in 2007 and then from about 2008 to 2016 was um, in and out of Afghanistan Um, and I think that uh, this desire to understand conflict and to to be involved in conflict and to serve God in that part of, um, in that environment that he has called me to is is what's in my DNA. Mm. I would say one more thing before before the next question. I think that uh, when I said I didn't want to go into the church, um, I genuinely didn't want to serve in the structure in the structure of the church, and there was quite a lot of pressure from some of the older elements of my family to actually go into the church. But it didn't resonate with my desire and what was in my DNA. But I think the second thing was that I felt that if I drew close to God, He would pull me out of the army and shunt me into the church. And so for um, a good 10 years between the ages of 16 and 26, I avoided getting too close to God in case I had this sort of dramatic moment 
where he would sort of, you know, move me into the structure of the church. And um, I'm grateful that, um, uh, what am I grateful for? I'm grateful for lots of things, but um, my encounters with him began uh, uh, in, uh, um, 1995 in, in a very profound way when the whole of the Toronto blessing was coming on and actually what was extraordinary was I, I had to put everything on the altar but he didn't say right now you've been counting me I'm going to drag you off and send you to a seminary or whatever it is and you'll learn to be a vicar and I think that we're all called to serve Christ in the priesthood of all believers wherever it is that he has um, set aside for us to serve him. Mm. Does that, that make is, sense? That is something I think many people struggle with in different ways. And people say to us, oh, wish I could serve Jesus like you do because we're travelling the world and speaking to pastors and leaders and that. We're like, no, 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 no. You know, find out what God's called you to do and be faithful. He doesn't want everybody what I would call, I'm use this very locked up in the church, as very often you get. He he needs people in every place in in society. And I, and I think this word ministry um, has got used wrongly and certainly I hate the phrase full-time ministry because we're all in full-time ministry wherever we are it just looks differently yeah absolutely no well put um I think uh what really at that time what really helped me think in the way you're talking Daphne is we were going to we started going to uh, Kensington Temple uh, under Colin Dye and, um, you know, Colin had, you know, there's no business like God's business. Um, you know, people talk about their Christian life. And, and he would go after that and say, as if you have life outside Christ. And it really started to blow apart all this sort of, these, these lines and boundaries that um, we put upon ourselves um, that aren't of God. And I would meet people kind of three or four years later who would say, you know, do you really talk about Jesus Christ in the officer's mess like that? And I said, well, yes, of course I do. You know, how could you not share Jesus Christ with someone who you like, you know, and sit in the same room as day in, day out? Mm. And, um, you know, do, I remember being recently with the church of England vicar and we were about 10 of us I mustn't have a go at the church in England okay it's not my job to but he was still saying now I'm going to do something a little bit uh, I said let's celebrate communion and he said I'm going to do something a little bit off the grid and I hope my bishop doesn't hear or see about this but I'm going to celebrate communion with you outside of church and I just thought goodness me fella you know loosen up chap you don't need any of this sort of bishop permission to celebrate communion. And, you know, in that mindset, um, I remember in 2006 being woken at six o'clock in the morning uh, and told that I needed to go and tell a soldier's wife that her husband had been blown up in Afghanistan three or four hours earlier. And... Uh, it was quite a heavy experience to bring that level of bad news to someone. And um, I ended up spending about 12 hours with her. And I remember walking out of that thinking that if I, as the officer responsible for delivering the plan of attack, I, as the believer, have a responsibility to... Um, tell my soldiers unequivocally about Jesus Christ, about who God is, and about heaven and hell. And so that instant happened, um, I think, in the last week of July in 2006. And I was on exercise with my soldiers, preparing to go to Iraq about a month later. 
And I just said, right, you know, I found the boss around here. If we're on exercise on Sunday and there's a you know chance, a gap in the in the rhythm or the in what we're doing, uh, you you know, there's a voluntary church service. I mean, church service is the wrong word, but it's probably the word I use. Yeah. Um, where I will preach. So I used to preach um, every Sunday when we were on operations or when we were on exercise. Um, uh, actually, so I keep going a little bit on that. Do you want a few stories on that? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah go for it. On. Uh, and I remember, um, you know, some people were pretty shocked. Um, and I thought I'll use my command structure. So my second command will read the bit from the, you know, read the Bible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And I will preach, and then I will pray. Um, and I remember the second time I did that, um, I'd forgotten that um, I told everybody in the orders group the night before this was going to happen. And at nine o'clock in the morning, I was in my armored vehicle, and my sergeant major came to me and said, "Sir, there's about you know about thirty or forty blokes outside your vehicle." And I said, "What are they doing there?" He said, uh, well, apparently so. You said you were going to preach. So I said, oh, yeah, of course I've got <laughs> And I said, give him five minutes. And I said, Lord, what am I going to say to these men? And I remember feeling him say very clearly, tell them the story of the prodigal son, but call it the loving father. And so I got out there. We were in Scotland, uh, in Galloway. And one of my officers said, look, come on, let's not, he, he's not yet saved. And actually, I've just spent an hour talking to him just now. But he said, come on, you know, let's not do this in a sort of, you know, like a little motley group standing at the back of your, of your armored vehicle. Let's climb the highest mountain. <laughs> and from there, come on, boss, give him the good news. So there we go. <laughs> wow. Wow. And it was kind of nine o'clock in the morning. And what was extraordinary was as I was was reading, so the, 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 my second command, you know, read the scripture and then I preached. And as I looked at the group of the officers, I think, I think nearly all my officers came to that, as well as the soldiers. I mean, there, there were about 120 of them, so about a third came. And one of them, the, the, the subject was the loving father. One of them, his father was in jail. That was one of the officers. Another officer, um, his mother had died in a car crash after his parents had got divorced. And he had so much ill feeling towards his father. Another officer told me that, you know, the worst time of his life was when his parents got divorced and I got to know his father, his father was incredibly harsh with him and then the fourth so sorry, there's one officer who didn't come, the fourth officer, I know who I was speaking to an hour ago I know his, his father is so harsh with him and the damage that's done to him and then the fifth officer was a father himself who married a Russian girl and was already divorced at the age of 23 with a three or four year old daughter and it was just like the Lord was just saying to me come on this there's such a need here do not hold back you know trust me when I I you know trust me and you know that preaching I, mean, I could give you other stories from that but that preaching carried on um, in all our preparation to go to war, and it carried on in Iraq as well. Um, I'll st I may could talk a bit more about that, but I I'll probably stop there and let you ask a question. Yeah, that reminds me, when you said you climbed the mountain and took them with you, reminds me when Moses climbed the mountain, there was the one of blessing and the one of curse, and he spoke it over. Was it Chorazim was the one of blessing? Somebody's probably listening. Now you've got the wrong one, but never mind. And, uh, you know, I see you climbing that mountain with all those men. And 
not just proclaiming the blessing of, over their lives, but proclaiming the blessing over the nation as you stood up there, just as Moses did, that there is a loving Father. Mm. Amen. Mm. Amen. 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 And boy, does the nation need to know that. Yeah. And I think if we jump out into Afghan or the Islamic world, you know, Allah is not a father. He's no. not a father. And therefore, his, you know, those who worship him are orphans. And that orphan spirit dominates, um, dominates the Islamic world. It dominates their violence. Well, it's, you know, their I'm, territorial ambition and everything. I am so thankful, so thankful that God places people like you. Um, I mean, it's a mission field. I don't know whether that was not biblical, that, but it, it is the mission field. It is going um, where the gospel needs to be heard. And, and I'm, I, that is just profound, Mark. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I mean, you have, uh, you alluded to it earlier, you're, you know, when you're in command and you're about to send these men out on missions where any of them could lose their lives during the mission, that you wanted to also, in that same moment, provide them an opportunity to find their lives. Um, it's such a funny, not funny, but such an interesting line uh, that on one hand you're saying, now go, you may lose your life, uh, but also before you do, uh, let me give you an opportunity to find it. And God puts people in authority, and I think he rides through that authority. So you were, you were commanding this man. You were given author that authority by God. I mean, ultimately, he put you there, that authority. And it became the trumpet through which you could proclaim with God's authority to these men. And they listen to it. It's, gosh, I... I would love a picture of you up that mountain with those men. It, it, my mind, can I would be We can maybe reenact it. I've spoken to Mark on the phone a couple of times and he's been out of breath climbing up something. So. <laughs> but you can come to Israel with us and, and proclaim it yeah, up some mountains, mountains in Israel. We'll go to. That really exciting. I've been up Mount Sinai and I've been up uh, Masada. Mm. But there are many more mountains to climb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I so think... Go on. No, carry on, Mark. Carry on. I was going to say, actually. Um, yeah, I think also that I think it's a really good point to say, that Daphne, that God puts us in authority. And, you know, I was aware I carried a lot of favor. And um, the soldiers were aware of that as well. <laughs> Uh, you know, in Iraq, um, we got blown up, we got rocketed, we got shot at, um, but not, not a single soldier got uh, killed or had any life-changing injuries. And, you know, I remember one soldier, I mean, there's a point where we, you know, we'd be in a place and we'd leave it. And then three minutes later, the rocket would land just where we were. And I remember one soldier turning to me and just saying, you know, somebody up there is looking after us. And I think that we as leaders in a secular environment need to establish a climate and a culture in which people can and are encouraged to acknowledge praise and worship God. And it was okay in my, in my outfit to say things like that. And I can think of another time where we were going into uh, the city of Nazareth, which is very close to where Abraham was born, very close to the Chaldees. And the intelligence was all wrong. And we thought we were going into an environment that was under coalition control, but the opposite was true. And I remember my uh, corporate force uh, who worked for me in my headquarters. I really wanted to say, look, boys, I'm going to pray for you now, but I wanted it to come from them. And he said, not yet saved this time, he said, will you pray? 
And so I prayed before we headed out. And I remember my signaler, again, not yet saved, he said, wow, you know, I felt something going right up and down my spine. And I said, that was the Holy Ghost. And it really struck me how, you know, you have no idea what God is doing in the lives of the people you meet. You have no idea that this, this moment, you know, could be part of a series of moments that God is bringing to, to a key point in that individual's life. I remember on another occasion after giving a set of orders and um, I think I was sitting behind the barricade so they couldn't see me. And one officer turned to another officer and said, the trouble with going to battle, going to war with Goodwin Hudson is that he's done all the praying beforehand. So the enemy are either defeated or gone. So we never get the chance of having a punch up. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> it, it displayed what was in his heart. But I mean, you know, glory to God <laughs> for that. And that was true. I mean, we, we moved on a, uh, uh, I, um, the word isn't a magic carpet. We moved up on his divine presence um, through uncharted and dangerous territory. And I think that, you know, going back to Colin Dye's sort of some of his teaching back in sort of the late 90s, you know, you, you are the safest place in the world to be is in the center of God's will for your life whether that's, you know, in a Chinese prison, a POW, you know, Auschwitz, or, um, you know, or sitting in, in an office somewhere or sitting in your kitchen, um, uh, you know, involved in, in the things you're involved in. And um, we can't find, we can't manufacture, we can't achieve security outside of Jesus Christ outside of his hand on our lives, uh, just in the same way that we can't find forgiveness, healing, salvation, deliverance, or resurrection outside of, of Jesus Christ. Mm. It, Amen. It, yeah, what you just said about that soldier reminded me of uh, something that Colonel Richard Kemp said during an episode we did with him. Um, because I, I said to him... Uh, and you said about that soldier saying that you'd prayed, so there's not really going to be much of a battle for us. So uh, I said to Richard Kemp, you know, uh, you know, we don't, we don't want war. Um, uh, I can't exactly remember what my point was that I was making to him, but I was like, we, you know, we don't really want these wars and all that kind of stuff. And and he says, well, he says you're right, we don't want war, but if you join the army, it's because you want to be in one. Uh, you want the fight and he said it's he said it might seem like a bit of a weird way uh, a weird mindset but he said it's a bit like someone that performs surgery if you've got to cut someone's arm off uh, it's not that they want you to lose the arm but if you have got to lose it they want to be the ones cutting it off and uh, he said that's kind of what it's like is you know you join the army it's not that you necessarily want wars like you say but if there is one then I want to be the one fighting in that war um just remind that what that guy said to you reminds me of that it's like yeah hey look i signed up so i could fight someone <laughs> <laughs> he did and i think that you know if, if you want to be a banker then it's good that you like counting money <laughs> <laughs> you know and i think that i think richard kemp's example is really good i think if you want to be a surgeon then you want to do a really, really good job at cutting someone's arm off, you know. And, you know, as, as a patient, you want to go to someone who, who really likes prospers and does well and enjoys, <laughs> and does cutting arm off, comes cutting someone's arm off, you know, to the best of their ability. Yeah. What was it like for you the first time you ended up in a conflict and it was the first time you really faced a situation where, oh, look, I, like bullets are flying here. Like my life is in danger. And presumably in the training and everything that you get, they do some things to try and get your mind in a place where you can handle that kind of situation. But 
Um, I know for us, you know, when you talk about, you know, maybe for Christians, the the thought of persecution and things like that, you never really know how you're going to deal with that situation until you're actually in that situation. And so, you know, what was it like for you the first time you ended up in a situation in the in the military where, you know, your life was actually really in danger here? Um, how well had your training prepared you? Or was it just you found out in the moment that it, it I, I don't know, what, what was it like for you? Why well, don't we give two examples? So the first example would be when I wasn't close to Jesus um, and what that was like. And then secondly, you know, when I was walking with Jesus, what that's like. So being in Bosnia in 94, I remember the first time they started. So we were right, we were about 400 metres away from, less than that, about 300 metres away from the front line between the Muslim forces and the Serb forces. And um, quite often the Serb forces would fire into the building we were in and then, you know, it got worse as we got on and as, as, as the tour went, went on. And I think I was sort of back at that stage to that sort of slowly infantile, infantile or what's the word, immature approach that my young officers had. You know, I've come out here for some action. I've come out here for a punch up. This is all really exciting. They're firing down on here. I'm running in, I'm getting into some cover. You know, um, it's all a bit exciting in a sort of rather immature way. And then I remember the first time during that time when I was told to break cover in order to draw enemy fire, it was like, you know, I used to do a lot of jumping off cliffs into the sea. And it was like, you know, you just sort of do it. It's all part of the sort of fun and the adventure, the excitement. And of course, then when something goes wrong, you start to grow up very quickly. And um, just as we were leaving, uh, the people who were with us took some serious casualties. And there was a big wake up call in that moment. But I wasn't, you know, I was, everything was in my own strength at that stage. And my capacity to deal with what was coming at me was starting to fray at the edges quite significantly. But, um, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't broken. Um, and within a year of that happening, I really started to encounter Jesus in, in a big way. So that was a sort of slightly immature response um, when I wasn't under a huge threat, albeit, you know, artillery and tank runs coming into the building. Um, it was a big building, it was an old school. When I was in Iraq in 2007, um, people were getting killed wherever you were. You were getting killed in the desert where we were trying to um, interdict Iranians bringing IEDs into Basra. You'd get killed back at camp at the, at the, at the base at the airport. There was no safe area at all. And I think the one thing, I could say a lot of things about that, the one thing that I was very aware of that, that goes a little bit back to what you were saying, Daphne, about a pure heart, I think that if you contain, if you have the Holy Spirit of God in you, the Holy Spirit of God is just pumping with life the whole time. And when you go and live in the valley of the shadow of death, if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, your spirit has a tendency to bend towards death. And people at quite a senior level are sort of almost acquiescing that spirit of death uh, because it was the most convenient and the easiest way out. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not judging them or accusing them of cowardice, but I'm saying that everything in me was choosing life and everything in me believed that we could live and succeed in that environment. So I want to give one quite extreme example of that. Is that all right? Can I do that? Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, so yeah, just to clarify, so you're saying that the, the situation was so bad that that you, your mind can easily go, how are we even going to possibly get out of this? You know, we're, 
it looks like death is our way out. You know, we, I can't see the hope at the end of the tunnel. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, my boss said to me, you know, when are the senior officers going to realise that, that we can't actually do this? How many of us have got to die before they give us a different mission? Mm. And I lost it with him. I just said, you know, we're not going to die out here. We're not going to lose soldiers out here. We're the leaders here, and our job is to um, preserve the lives of our soldiers and to carry out our mission. So to give a small example of that, and uh, this is glory to God, you know, I'm saying this comes from the Holy Spirit, and the difference between being in Bosnia in 94 and being in Iraq in 2007, where I'm carrying the Holy Spirit in 2007, is, is almost like um, oil and water. So when uh, we were, there was an instant where we were formed up to go out into the desert and it was me and five other officers and then there were 63 soldiers from another regiment who were joining us and we were waiting at the airport. It was about six o'clock in the evening and the sun was starting to, to go down and it was in February. And in my spirit... I got a sense that there was there was imminent danger. That's all I felt. And we were supposed to leave at six o'clock and it was now 6.30. And at that time, the Jesh al-Mahdi uh, who were running Basra were firing rockets into the airport. And the, uh, the, 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 the airstrip and the aircraft were obviously um, quite a priority target in that. And we were just standing there waiting. And as we were waiting, um, and we'd been there for half an hour, the pilot came out and swore at us and said, get on the back of the plane now. Get, get on, get on the plane. We've got to leave. And if you look at military planes, you've probably seen quite a lot of them recently in Afghanistan. You've got the tailgate at the back there, and then it opens up into this huge plane with kind of rows of seats either side, and then you put all your kit in the middle. And she said that, and I immediately turned around and put my foot onto the tailgate to get in. And I was the first person onto the plane. And the engines are wiring like this. And as soon as I put my foot on the tailgate, I got punched in the gut by the Holy Spirit. And with that punch came a very clear, clear um, command to pray. And in that command, there wasn't anything, there was no like, if you want to, or immediately my Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit inside me just erupted. And I started praying in tongues. So I walked up the center of the aircraft with the engines whirring, everybody else coming back. Just roaring in the spirit. No one could hear me because of the noise of the, the engines roaring either side of the plane. And sometimes when I've told this story, people say, are you sure you are? We already punched in the Holy Spirit. And I've punched people and I've been punched and I was punched, okay? Punched in the gut by the Holy Spirit. And so I prayed and I sat down at the front right of the aircraft, took off into the night and thought nothing of it. It was a sort of like a supernatural moment. And um, I was sort of thankful to God for all the things that he had done in my life leading up to that point. Here I was, I had my ammunition, my gun, I had some grenades. I was going out the door into the desert to um, prepare to get ready to take command of whole groups of soldiers and start to carry out this mission of interdiction of Iranian terrorists. And we were supposed to be up in the air for half an hour. We were in there for two hours and no one really knew why. And we were landing on one of Saddam Hussein's airstrips in the Iran-Iraq war, which is just a very simple piece of concrete, um, just wide enough, strip of concrete, uh, just kind of wide enough to, for, a plane, for one plane to touch down 
land and take off on. And there's no lighting or anything because it's a covert landing strip. What I didn't know was that the British Army had landed this aircraft there for five Monday nights in a row at six o'clock in the evening. So it set a pattern. Mm. And we got the indication we're coming down, we're coming down. So we all sort of sit there getting ready to land. And just as we land, there are two massive explosions. And um, I look up and the whole of the uh, left-hand side of the aircraft is on fire. And the plane uh, has, has lost its left wing, basically. It's been blown off. And as a result, the plane's off balance. And it veers straight off the runway and is bouncing along the 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 the, 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 the desert the the the, the, um, the bumps of all the desert and the aircraft is is trying to deaccelerate um it's filling with smoke um soldiers are starting to scream uh people are starting to panic because we realize the plane's on fire the plane's full of av gas which is the most flammable fuel we're still moving we can't get off. We've got to get off. And from a, uh, a sort of training perspective, whenever you create an issue like that, um, you whenever you use a mine, you always cover it with machine gun fire. So what I was expecting was the enemy of blowing the wing off the plane. The plane's going to come eventually to a standstill. It's either going to blow up or they're going to be firing a machine gun into the, into the plane, or both. And we came to a standstill. Of course, you never listen to um, anybody in an airplane who tells you where the exit doors are. And all of a sudden, everybody's trying to find an exit to get out. The tailgate is jammed because um, half the plane's on fire, the wing's missing. And I eventually, we get off. And... 68 soldiers got onto that plane and 68 soldiers got off alive. And for reasons that no one will ever understand, the plane didn't blow up. Wow. And I've seen footage uh, from a, a UAV, a drone that was covering our landing. The whole of the screen of the drone just fills with fire. And what had happened was that the, the Jersh Mahdi had worked out that were using this airstrip, they worked out where we land on the airstrip and they put 15 IEDs either side at the start of the airstrip. And they saw that we always landed at this part of the airstrip. So they put the IEDs set to go off whilst we were still in the air. And the IEDs had a laser beam, which one of them 800 meters away had turned on. So that as the wing went across the laser beam, it would trigger the IED. But what was extraordinary was only two IEDs went off. And for the first time, rather than landing here, we landed there. So by the time we hit the, the, the daisy chain of IEDs, we were already on the ground. Because if that wing had come off, just two of them to take that wing off, and we're in the air, we'd have been, we'd have been brown bread. And one could see in that uh, the authority that God gives us, the command that God gives us, the power that God gives us, the anointing that God gives us, the reasons that God wants his people in these places in order to deliver and, and, and uh, carry out his will and his purposes. And God is more than enough to deal with 30 IEDs. He is more than enough more than enough and um you know we we just have to be available and you know this was his shout he did it you know i didn't even have an option i got punched in the stomach and, and the command to pray mm. and it was such a revelation of god's power god's anointing god's calling god's purposes and you know, it goes back to that, that, that piece of the cross where he overcame Satan, where he took authority, and he is giving us the same authority 
today. And it's that sentence I used when we were praying. You know, God wants us to engage in the spiritual realm in order to change the lay down in the natural. And, you know, our, our mistake is to see everything in, in the natural without actually looking up and realizing that he is on the throne and he has purposes for us um, that start in the spiritual uh, and are used to impact the natural. So I've given a rather long answer there. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I've been thinking all through this. You have done what I was going to ask you, which is what did you learn in the army and as an officer that transfers to us as believers? And you have talked about that a lot. Mm. But sometimes, I must admit, I get a bit exasperated because Paul talks about us being a good soldier. We think about us being God's army, etc. And yet we sit around like, um, well, I don't... We don't look very military-like. We don't look very military-like. We don't act very military-like. Uh, and, and yet we use that terminology and don't apply it. Don't apply the disciplines. So does of, that yeah. for you... Um, I'm asking you just straight, does that exasperate you when you see the body of Christ hanging around like a bunch of amateurs where really we should be under the commandership of Jesus and highly trained in his army? Well, I think that, um, I think the ecclesia, I mean, the, the people, you know, are, are, you know, all our friends, you know, your friends, my friends, we understand that we're in a spiritual battle mm. and that's where it begins. Therefore, you realize quickly that you are, you're a fighter, you're a war fighter, you're a warrior. And that identity gives you um, the purpose, the meaning, the focus that's required in order to, to walk in um, his ways. I think that um, there are people, I'm not sure if they are in the Ecclesia, but they might be in the, um, the regular church um, who don't understand the... Um, there's a sort of lovey-dovey message which is going out there at the moment, um, which sort of bleeds into... bleeds into... Oh, that's a bit of a military phrase. It sort of stumbles into... Um, all becomes all sorts of very woolly theology that is, you know, we just got to love everybody and feel good and everybody needs to be, you know, everyone's okay and we're going to be all right and, you know, God's on the throne, it's okay. And uh, I, I don't think that's biblical. And I think that um, God is on the throne, but he wants to us to partner him in in writing the enemy, in reclaiming um, the, the land and uh, heading for the promised land. And, you know, God didn't mince it at Jericho. Amen. And um, we're not called to, um, I think that going back to Richard Kemp's example, you know, if you've got a gangrenous arm here, you've got to cut it off. You know, with, you know, friends who had tumours in their brain, in their head, you know, someone's got to get a knife in there and cut it out. And, um, you know, in God's name and, and under his direction, authority, we do that. And I think, you know, going back to that example on the plane, I, God didn't want that plane to be blown up. Um, and, you know, he... he, he, he you know, shook me in violently. You know, he punched me in the gut. It wasn't like I was, medit you know, as deep in prayer. It's a legitimate way. There's only one way being deep in prayer, but it was, he addressed me soldier to soldier, you know, straight in. Mm -hmm. Come on, fella, you've got to pray. Um, and I think all of us, you know, when we need to see 
see an awful lot of, of, of what we look at outside of our lives as being a battle. She's not even outside of our lives. There's a battle in our own lives. Mm. You know, there's a battle for all the things that distract us and take us away and the temptations of the flesh and all those things. So mm. um, it starts with our understanding the spiritual dimension. It starts with the way we conduct our own lives and then it spills out into how we engage in our locality in the nation and in the globe and you know that global prayer meeting you organized about 10 or two weeks ago i mean that was full on you know we had people from jerusalem hong kong malaysia all over the place you know really engaging at a global and national level in no uncertain terms and um you know, those guys know who they are. They know they're in a fight. And they also know who the winner is. Amen? Yeah, yeah. I want to um, talk a bit about maybe some of the after effects of being in some of these situations um, in a bit. But before we do that, um, Afghanistan, all over the news. Everyone sees what's going on out there. Obviously, we've been heavily involved uh, over the last seven, ten days or so. Um, can you talk a bit about your time serving in Afghanistan? Um, what what were you doing out there? What was it like? What was some of that experience like for you? Okay, so the first time I went out there, I was setting up a series of surveillance systems in the forward operating bases uh, in Helmand province. And... Um, you know, I like the mountains, I like mountain people, I like wild places, and I, I thought Afghanistan was beautiful. And um, at that point, I didn't really get much engagement with local Afghans. I then went back out again in 2014, where I was doing an audit on um, how we were conducting intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. Um, and... I think that um, just quickly on that one, I think that we were totally and utterly enemy focused. So I was involved in setting up the Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Brigade, which was 6,200 people, which was quite a large part. Was, it was the second biggest brigade in the army. And um, the whole of that effort was focused on, on the enemy and killing the enemy. And I think going back to the, the tumour in the head or the amputation of the arm, yes, we do need to focus some of our effort on, on cutting the arm off, but the purpose of, of our focus is to save the body. And, um, you know, there was none of that. There was none of that in Afghanistan. And it was a deep flaw in how we were conducting military operations. You know, we just didn't know who the good guys were. We didn't know how to support the good guys. We didn't uh, really effectively at the tactical or even the operational level grow a, 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 a card or a cohort of leaders of communities that were going to succeed. And then the third time I was out there was I was working the NATO headquarters on current operations and then um, head of the NATO um, civilian casualty investigation and mitigation. So this is where um, coalition forces have killed civilians and um, looking at trying to um, ensure that we mitigated that. But that was the first time where I engaged with American missionaries and also Afghans who were believers in Afghanistan, and um, that was fascinating, really fascinating. And I think starting with the American missionaries, I mean, you met, I met people there who, you know, they had really, really, really given their lives to Jesus. You know, their, their lives, their, their wives, their children's lives were in danger on a constant basis. And there was no, there was no part-time about anything they did. They were just, whoosh, they were right in there. But also, I think, 
second point to make about them, and maybe it's an obvious point, but I think it's worth making to honour them. There was no religiosity about them. They were deeply, deeply practical and spiritual at the same time. And um, they dressed and looked like, uh, you know, one of the disciples. They had their sort of big, thick, heavy sort of sackcloth come robe stuff. And they had Afghan hats on and they had beards. And, you know, they, they, they lived, you know, they needed to catch fish. They needed, I don't mean that literally, they needed to feed themselves. They needed to house themselves, they needed to clothe themselves. Their relationship with God was, was profoundly real. And they were also dealing with some, you know, real threats. You know, one of them, his daughters woke up to find Taliban putting the gun uh, in their faces, in their beds. And the father was so proud. And the, and the Taliban pulled off at the last minute before pulling the trigger. And the father was so proud of them because his daughters said, what did the daughter say? The daughter was, said she knew she was going to go to heaven at that moment. And she wanted to, where's the effect? She wanted to forgive the Taliban before she went to heaven. Hmm. It was like, Daddy, I knew I was going to go to heaven and I, I wanted to forgive them before they killed me. And I mean, holy smoke. <laughs> You know, and he was so proud as a father. And I met uh, people who um, this guy had converted who were Afghans. Who, I mean, poor. You know, the suffering was extraordinary. Really extraordinary. Um, and this one guy, he was saying that... Um, you know, when he was moving around, he was running an underground church in Afghanistan, that before he went into a city, he had to ask the Lord what the demonic strongholds were in that city. Otherwise, if he didn't, you know, he, and, and then he would bind them and put them on the foot of the cross of Jesus and declare whatever the Lord was telling him to declare in that city, him over that city, telling him to declare over that city. Otherwise, if he didn't, you know, things could go very badly wrong for him. And I think, you know, when you're operating, I mean, this is going back, Daphne, as you were saying about being a soldier, when you're operating in that level of life and death and understanding of the spiritual dynamic, you know, I remember coming back from Afghan and thinking, you know, why, uh, you know, why am I not doing this? You know, why am I surprised when I go to a meeting in Whitehall or I go to a meeting in Army headquarters that there's absolute chaos and there's gibber, you know, chaos, that, that the outcomes are so crass. Mm. And yet, if I walked into those spaces in the same way that this Afghan missionary was walking into the cities, how different might those outcomes be? Mm. And it's like, because we're not under a life and death threat here, we can get quite flabby and quite idle. And it's going back to that point that under persecution, and it's so perverse in the natural, we come alive. Having said that, you know, I, maybe I, I was saying to my wife that, um, you know, they're saying that the Christian church is almost extinct in Syria or, 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 and also in Iraq. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's distressing. But then she made the point, you know, is that a secular um, report or is that a, you know, is that a, is that a Christian report? And mm. There's this extraordinary tension between coming alive in persecution and being obliterated, or not obliterated, but killed in persecution. Um, when I worked in the MOD, I used to uh, go to a small garden square that's about 200 meters away from the MOD. And there's a picture, a picture there's a statue of Tyndale. I think it's Tyndale. And there's a pile, and he's standing there, and there's a pile of books that are just stacked up beside him. And it said that in 1529, Tyndale was burnt at the stake. Whether it was Tyndale or Moore, I can't remember which one. 
for um, wanting to bring the Bible to this nation. And then the next sentence is, uh, I mean, the wokists from the Britain of this from there when they didn't even give him a statue, um, poor wokists. But the next sentence is, and in 1530, you know, obviously after Tyndale's been burnt at the stake, there's an explosion of Bibles across, across the country. And yeah, in the same way that Jesus' blood is what has saved us and is saving us and will save us. Um, it's the blood of the martyrs that, you know, that we see, we see the power of God. It's difficult there. It's difficult. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, as we start to wrap up, um, you you go through some of these traumatic experiences, um, some with a, a greater or lesser degree of being connected to to Jesus through them. But what did you have any after effects, PTSD, all that kind of stuff? How do you deal with those things? Maybe when you got home. Uh, maybe it wasn't till after you retired uh, and you didn't have to deal with it um, again. Uh, how did you walk through some of those things or did you have to? It's a good question. Um, I remember when I came back from Kosovo, um, Colin Dye, I was in a sort of midweek service and Colin Dye had a word and I knew it was for me. Uh, and I can't remember what it was to do with. And I walked to the front, and Colin put his hand on me. Spirit of God hit me, and I, I hit the floor like a sack of potatoes. And um, I knew that word was to do with Kosovo. And I think the point, the first point to make there is that, you know, when I came back from Bosnia earlier, and I wasn't really with the Lord, there was a lot of unforgiveness, bitterness, confusion, and hurt. Um, I think when I came back from Kosovo in 99 and I was with the Lord, the Lord can deal with that stuff and he wants to deal with that stuff. And actually, interestingly, as I'm talking, in 95, what are we in? Yeah, sorry, 95 and 1995 and 96. The Lord started, and with words of knowledge, actually, people having words of knowledge that started to cut into what was going on in the interior. Um, and I think that when we keep worshipping the Lord, when we keep, you know, going forward and embracing the Holy Spirit and, and, um, and chasing after him, stuff happens that we may or may not know about in, in our interior that might relate to some of that. So I used to get a lot of sweats at night and I used to have nightmares where people are trying to kill me. And um, I felt that all of that was just, you know, I, I, and when you say, when I say to my wife, you know, I had a nightmare last night, someone's trying to kill me. She's slightly horrified because she doesn't have nightmares where people are trying to kill her. And I suppose that I realized it wasn't normal to have nightmares. <laughs> and um, I don't know, I haven't gone forward specifically for those things, but um, I don't have nightmares these days where people are trying to kill me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I mean, I've got some, I have some pretty weighty individuals, and we, we pray you know, on a regular basis. Uh, And I think all of us need to be in relationship, in fellowship, part of a community, reaching up and out, as well as reaching across and and down to help others. Um, You know, it's a bloke who I I see, uh, I called him up about three weeks ago, and we we clock in, and, you know, he's like a, he's older and like a, you know, mighty father, figure, man of God. And I mean, when Clive embraces you and prays for you, holy smoke, does stuff happen. And, um, you know, it, it 
it gets left at the foot of the cross of Jesus. And I think, sorry, I'm going on a bit. I suppose as we're talking, I'm starting to remember more stuff. I had, I don't know whether you're familiar with lie busting, which is a form of prayer. It's kind of industrial level of prayer where you deal with stuff that's either happened to you or you've inherited uh, in your DNA, in the spirit. And, um, of course, trauma brings in all sorts of, of spiritual stuff. And in 2012, I had a, a massive encounter with the Lord. And we were dealing basically with, you know, demonic strongholds. And I think that when you are getting free of demonic strongholds, when you... Um, you know, you get an explosion or, or something happens. Um, it's slightly the explosion isn't the issue. The explosion opens the door. It's what then wants to come in from the enemy as a result of that. And um, we've got to deal with that stuff. You know, all of us have got to deal with that stuff. And we've got to go after and get help until we've, we've got free of it because Jesus can free of that, us of that stuff. Uh, but whilst we carry it around, there's a warping and a lack of wholeness that um, is not good. Yeah. 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 Mark, thank you. Um, we really appreciate you coming, taking the time, sharing some of the stories uh, the things that you've experienced in life, I think some really good helpful tips there at the end as you're speaking for people that are going through traumas, um, you know, that having that community, people that you can engage in conversations with, that you're not an island having to deal with that stuff on your own. Uh, so anyone that is listening that's struggling with that stuff, you know, encourage you to 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 take hold of some of these tips that, that Mark has just mentioned and uh, and put those into action. Um, yeah, and not be afraid to reach out for help. Yeah, yeah, don't, yeah, don't be afraid to reach out to help. Go on, Mark. Well, yeah, and ask God. You know, all of it is good. You know, Lord, you know, I'm waking up in the middle of the night with sweats. I don't believe that's your best plan for my life. Uh, I'm going to pursue. You know, Lord, lead me, show me, take me to people, um, to Scripture, to whatever you want to do that will enable me to get free of this because you know holiness and wholeness are, are you know wholeness is spelled h-o-l-i-n-e-s-s period you know there's no if or but about that and mm. holiness is spelled wholeness you know so and, I, and you know i think the more whole we become the more the holy spirit just freely flows out of us and if i look back to this kind of early days at Kensington Temple, that was, that was very, sorry, I'm doing far too much talking. I, I suddenly got on something. No, you're good. Anyway, I want to help people, but, you know, um, there was, um, you know, wholeness and, and, and allowing God's Holy Spirit to flow out of one is what's so powerful. And, you know, the story of, of, of as the apostle rode past a man, on the road, his shadow healed him. I mean, mm. you know, we're, we're called to carry that that level of of, of Holy Spirit of wholeness. Amen? Yeah. Yeah, I just want to add one little thing on the end. So we, you're winding down and we're carrying on. Um, <laughs> but but um, Daniela, your sister, um, works in the area of anti-human trafficking where there is a lot of trauma and I just want to throw it out there that there is no shame in going for counselling, mm. good counselling, trauma counselling. I think some people think that that's a failure, but in actual fact, you know, there's some very good people out there that can really walk you through and people who love Jesus as mm. well. God can use even counsellors. He will use that and he will use... So I just wanted to throw that out there because sometimes people feel that counselling is... Is, is a negative thing where in actual fact you have a good counsellor, especially one who loves Jesus, specialists in trauma, they will really walk you through these things. Mm. 
Yeah. Amen to that. I mean, I think, you know, I wouldn't want to process my life with someone who didn't know Jesus. Mm. You know, the purpose of having a counselor is the part the counselor knows Jesus and has got experience with dealing with yeah. this area. And the two are really important because I need to process what's going on with the Lord. I've got to. I have to. Otherwise, I'll just get, you know, taken off on some absolute rubbish, you know, um, absolute nonsense. Yeah. There's enough of it out there. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mark, thank you. Thank you so hey, much. Thank you. Really God bless it. you both. And we invited you on to talk. So um, it would have been a funny podcast if you came on and didn't really say anything. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank well, you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you both. Thank you for listening to this episode. If it inspired you, please rate us and subscribe on Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify or another podcast platform.